All right. Um, great. Then I'm going to start by just introducing the, the talk and the event that we're having today and, um, and welcome all of you to this talk on the theme of innovative learning on permaculture for refugee use in East Africa. And it's an honor for me to um, introduce Pemeriki Bissimu Adesabe, who is the amazing founder of the Ramwanja Rural Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to combating malnutrition and developing local entrepreneurship um, with a focus on refugees, and which is based in the, the Ramwanja refugee settlement in Uganda. So Ben Ariki will be sharing his own story and experience with permaculture training with uh, young refugees in East Africa and some reflections on the current needs and possible ways forward uh, to enhance permaculture learning in the region, including through innovative practices and approaches. And for those who are not fully familiar with what permaculture is, I try to find a definition that could help put everybody on the same page as we start this event. So permaculture is actually the contraction of two terms, uh, permanent and agriculture originally, but it was later adapted to permanent and culture um, in order to translate a broader approach. And according to Tim Mollison, who coined the term in 1978, so permaculture is the conscious design and maintenance, maintenance of agriculturally productive ecosystems which have the diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems. It is the harmonious integration of landscape and people providing their food, energy, shelter, and other material and non-material needs in a sustainable way. So I had the chance of meeting Ben Ericki through the Global Regeneration Collab in May last year. Uh, so the Global Regeneration Collab is an international network of professionals working on regeneration, including on regenerative agriculture. And through conversation, I came to know of the amazing work uh, and very impressive work that Ben Ericki has been uh, undertaking in the Ramwanja refugee settlement, but also in other refugee settlements in East Africa. Uh, with the support of the Permaculture Education Institute, Ethos Foundation, and Permayus, uh, which are organizations based in Australia and founded by Maura Gamble that have been provided continuous support um, to the work of Bemeriki. And uh, the latest figures that I have, but maybe the higher, is that uh, Bemeriki has trained over 500 youth in permaculture with a focus on young women. Uh, so as to ensure food security, particularly at the time where Uganda was under strict lockdown and uh, the refugee population was prevented to uh, complement the type of uh, food and cash that they were given by UN organizations at the time where uh, those, um, this, this support by the UN organizations for refugees was decreasing. So there was this very strong need to come up with approaches to um, ensure better food security. And um, when we heard about this story at One Regent Earth, we immediately wanted to support the best we can this amazing work, but we are very young organizations. And so we worked essentially in terms of providing some advice in relation to climate resilience, access to some of our networks, uh, visibility and support for fundraising as much as we could. And uh, that's what we've been doing for the past six months or so through this collaboration. And we've even succeeded in transferring about 10% of the private donations that were given to One Resident Earth for the Ramon Jarwal Foundation in 2021, and hope we'll be able to do better this year with the support of all. So just so you know, um, and in case you're wondering what's my role in, in the situation and what's the role of One Resident Earth in relation to the the Ramon Jarrell Foundation. So I just want to highlight that One Resident Earth is a nonprofit organization based in Germany with a mission to educate about the multiple impacts of climate change on our health, including on our emotional and uh, mental health, and to build the resilience of individuals, communities, and ecosystems to the combined impacts of climate change and the ecological crisis more broadly. So for that purpose, we mobilize a regenerative and transdisciplinary approach 
um, that, that brings together and fosters synergies between art, science, ancient wisdom, and new technologies when relevant. And in practice, we share um, inspiration on climate resilience and regeneration through a magazine that we have that's called Tero. We also provide um, workshops and open sharing places um, and transformative events um, in relation to climate resilience and regeneration. We support some pioneering art science projects, uh, including with universities and museums. And we facilitate inclusive dialogues and catalyze resources for our local communities that are looking into long-term resilience. So it includes the community that uh, Bemerick is supporting, but we've worked in the past also with a community in, in North Atlantic Canada. And last, we support organizations quite generally that are committed to transformation, regeneration, and resilience. Uh, for instance, at the moment, we are supporting a project led by the UN Development Program on Conscious Food System, which is called the Conscious Food Systems Alliance. So as I've just mentioned, so we had worked with a community in Atlantic Canada before, and we're very thrilled to be approached by the Meriki um, as the work he's been doing actually contributes directly to increasing the resilience of the refugee communities in many ways. So um, I'll just give you a few examples. So permaculture techniques, thanks to the biological diversity they foster, make food growing far more resistant to droughts and erratic rainfalls than monoculture, uh, while the positive impacts of permaculture in terms of green cover and the regeneration of the soil help sequester carbon. Um, in addition, the project is targeting women, particularly young women, giving them access to food and diversifying um, their livelihood sources, which is essential to enhance capacity to cope with future climate change impacts, acknowledging that women are always more vulnerable to climate change impacts than men for a variety of reasons. And last, by contributing to the regeneration of the local ecosystem through the permaculture activities, but also through reforestation, uh, the project by, led by Bemeriki are actually contributing to uh, limiting the overall impacts of climate change on the settlement uh, by limiting increase in, in temperature through healthy ecosystems, reducing the risk of mudslides or desertification and helping to conserve biodiversity. Um, so that's just to give you like a broad introduction of both the work of Bemeriki, the relevance of his work in relation to climate resilience and regeneration, um, the importance of collaborating and learning from one another in, in the processes of, of building resilience and regeneration. Um, but I will now give the word to Ben Eriki. I have a few questions for him that were shared in the description of the event. And um, following this question and answer sessions between the two of us, we'll be very happy to open the floor to all of you to hear about your own questions, experiences, uh, feedback on what you've heard, any comments that are relevant uh, to you, and that could, you know, uh, open up other dialogues and conversations. So, um, Ben Eriki, if this is fine with you, my first question for you would be to ask you if you can share your story and how you came to found the Ramwanja Rural Foundation, and what was the, the mission that you had in mind for that organization at, at the start of your work. Well, uh, thank you very much, Nadine. Yeah, as you have heard about me, I'm Bemerik Bissima Dusabe, I'm a refugee from Democratic Republic of Congo, living in Uganda. I've been here in Uganda for almost a decade and a half, which is 15 years. Uh, the reason and uh, the beginning of my journey with the Manjaro Foundation Limited is that um, as I've been a refugee here, we have experience of malnutrition. First of all, um, between the women and children, especially for pregnant women and children killed just pregnant. So you could do ask yourself if at all she's 
is Udushi way. Two, in terms of uh, climate uh, resilience or environment, we have had the challenge of uh, almost destroying and uh, degrading the environment because most of trees are being cut from host community. They come and they sell us shackles. So with that regard, we sat and uh, I thought of how can we just mitigate this impact? One, I started when I was working as a teacher, I could buy vegetable seeds, then I, I put them in nursery bed, then I look for sacks. I call people in my community to come and pick seedlings, then they go and they plant to their home. The reason to do this, uh, it was just to see how this, the community can have access to vegetables, because it is challenging for refugees to have access to vegetables. Monthly, we used to receive uh, 10 kilograms or 11 kilograms of maize corn and uh, 225 kilograms of beans. That was a monthly ration. So since COVID came in, uh, it was just hectic to how the food will be good. Uh, the wire house of uh, WFP was in Kenya, of which Kenya had the high rate number of COVID affected people and uh, the border was closed. So refugees had nowhere to turn to. And no, they couldn't even bounce back after the shock. So uh, that's how I got a um, huge request from refugees and the host community to train them in permaculture. So um, in this year's around 221, we trained 620 people in permaculture, especially women and youth. Uh, then, uh, in terms of climate resilience, we have established three uh, food forests, one in Rwamwanja, another one in Nachivare, and another one in Chaka, two refugee settlement. We are also doing that by teaching community how to use waste that we are producing, because sometimes it is waste, and it is also dangerous to us, again, to the environment. So we are teaching them to make uh, briquettes which will be used to cook their food. Uh, with that, we reduce on waste. We are reducing uh, diseases like cholera and the other pandemic that we do come and it kills us. Then we use that in cooking food. So um, women, we are empowering them by doing so because we have experienced much and many cases of rape and defilement for our young girls and women when they cross to the host community, and uh, especially in a singular district, when they could return to Tanzania, crossing the borders, some were raped. The result to that was HIV positive, another one and wanted a pregnancy, and uh, that is a challenge to add trauma to most of the girls in the in Chaka to refugee settlement and other parts of the countries, Kenya, Tanzania, and the Uganda as well. So we are also empowering them in shampoo making, um, skin gel making. We also help them with also Vicilas, which is a village saving and loan association. We are coming up with this permaculture and regenerative uh, to transform rights of refugees. So that's, in short, we have, I have many things that I does need, but uh, just to highlight the few, that's how, I does it. And uh, also um, seeing that the number have increased, the demand is high. We list the suppliers is raised. We have come up with the ideas of facilitating them online using the digital learning, which would come as a question. So I've talked about it. Um, the reason how did we come up with this is that uh, the demand is high in no refugee settlement or in, even in the high in the host community they are requesting for the same training but remember we had a restriction and a lockdown of which i could not be able to travel and teach so that's how we came up with the online system to see how best we can meet either on whatsapp facebook zoom and um, other ways even google to see how best they have, have access also sharing with the demo the resources that have produced like video, which is teaching materials. So we have them on YouTube. I hope we will see some videos 
we have good team, a big team of our talented youth who are also advocating for climate resilience and climate change through videos and song, of which you are going to see just in a few minutes to come. So in short, that's all about me. We work as non-profit, we don't work for profit, we just help people see how best they can maneuver with the life that they are facing across refugee settlement. Thanks a lot, Bamariki. Yeah, you, you skipped that. You went directly to the second question, which is great. And you highlighted how we how you actually complemented um, in-person training with digital training and at some point totally replaced the in-person training with digital training because of the limitations of COVID. And when I first heard about the fact that you were teaching uh, permaculture through digital means, uh, I, was, I was wondering in a way how you could actually teach something that feels so uh, related to the earth, you know, so concrete and so practical fully digitally, I guess that was my first question. And then there was something very interesting in realizing that uh, despite all the conversations on the digital divide and the fact that 3 million people don't have access to the internet, you actually managed to make it work um, with refugee populations um, in East Africa. So were there any kind of specific, specific technical challenges that you had to address in order to make it work? And how did you manage to really provide this um, agriculture training uh, virtually fully? You're, you're still muted. You need to unmute yourself. Well, uh, it, was, it, it wasn't fully as we intended. Uh, there is a saying that uh, one sorrow does not make summer. Though good things were done, but uh, I still have more good to be done as well. Well, it is a challenge and we still have that barrier, especially for refugees to have access to it the materials that are needed when it is online. One, the first challenge is access to devices. We have several hubs, like in, I have almost 13 hubs that I co coordinate. I have two hubs in Kenya, Kakum and Karubaye. I have Mutenderi, Nduta, Nyarugusu, those are five, plus seven here in Uganda. So you find that it is a challenge for them to have devices. Once, how will they meet together? If at all we have, they have like it, it was, yes, I can hear. Can you hear me then? Yeah, now we can hear you well. Cool. So it was the challenge for the devices to how will they have access to all materials because we would find two or three people have a mobile phone for the Zoom meeting. So, and they could not congest themselves due to the guidance from Minister of Health. That was a second barrier. The third barrier is to have 40 megabytes to cover the whole course. Um, that's the barrier for the technical issues that I had. Then responding to your question to how do I fully go to the practical terms? Well, whenever I'm teaching one course offline or in person, once we just share the resources on my YouTube channel is where the request comes from. Then how the, the methods that we use with the Permaculture Education Institute and Pharma Youth is that it. the youth or Ethos Foundation sponsor one or two person from that specific location to come and attend the offline course where I'm training from. Like um, now I'm today, tomorrow I'm traveling, going to Northern Uganda in Kitu. So there will be people who will be attending the training of which I will attend, I will train maybe in May or June. So when we, the person is sponsored, he become an ambassador. He goes back to his or her village, just spreading the knowledge, then mobilizing people. Then they invite me to go and also train them again. The, the online training is monitoring. And after training, once I did the introduction online, then I have to go again to train them face-to-face -face so that they can do practice and understand better. 
that's how it does it. Thanks for that, Ben Eriki. Yeah, and it's true that your your YouTube channel actually has lots of videos that show you doing the work also like directly on, on the field. So we can actually get a very good understanding of how that works beyond uh, the theory. So yeah, we'll we'll share a link to the to the YouTube channel afterwards if you want to, to have a look yourself. And maybe if we can move to the third question which is about um, the role of the arts, including the role of, of music and filmmaking and how the arts have been playing an integral role in, in the work and the permacultural projects that you've been developing and how you've used them also to help restore the health of individuals and of the communities that, that you were working with. Um, and so I'd be happy to hear from you about uh, why to you this artistic dimension was very important in the work that you were doing and how you've been able to uh, integrate that dimension to the, the agricultural work that was happening. But we also have some videos um, to show you if you want to. So Leverick, do you want to speak first about the, the music and the arts or do you want me to show the videos first? And I can't hear you right now, so maybe you can, take you can share a video first so that you okay. can understand us the other those. Okay, good. Maji machafu to sing a tena. Missy to see to to send a tena. Palma kaji meleta njia fupi kwa kuraisi cha maisha kama vile kutengeneza makala na mengi tumeyajua Palma kaji imetufundisha tukipanda moga tusiweke kemikali aweze tuziwe sawa moga tusiweke dawa mazingira yawe sawa salama angalia watoto tam tam wanatumia moga pia maji masafi afya zao ni nzuri thank you palma kaja kuleta mambo mapya hapa kwetu chaka tunawashukuru we say thank you palma kaja we say thank you god bless you palma kaja we love you you've made our life so easy now doing pure work we use the comedy chako vile baby za wa food ay ay of lives are dangerous because of the waste that we produce every day. Hundreds of children are dying of cholera brought by these waste. But we get a clean environment, care for our nature by reusing and recycling all the waste into new materials. We clean our towns, villages, and homes, and we make life cooler every day because of permaculture. Permaculture is the hope of the humanity. It's the way that leads us to a better future. Palma kacha makara yawe tura ya shima Na munu chija misamba gusha kimi Wadufa shise kugawa nye hunga wanarji chirele Kura chani wachu kwa tandu kanyeni mnyotzi Urubjiru kwa nargore katu gushime Kwa hugu wabzinsi chaka tura shima Waduha ya hot kwi daga durira Tuoni jogu kor, ni dufi tumanya wogut Yeah, yeah We say thank you, Palma Kacha, we say thank you God bless you, Palma Kacha, we love you You've made our love so easy Now we're doing pure work We use no comedy chako Vegetables are our food We send our sincere thanks To the Palma Kacha Education Institute Palma Youth Morag Gambo, teacher Bemuriki, who teaches permaculture in East Africa, refugee camps. Roland Asima. We say thank you, permaculture, we say thank you. God bless you, permaculture, we love you. You've made our love so easy. Now we're doing pure work. We use the comedy chako. Vegetables are our food. Ay, ay, ay.
All right, Benerick, do you want to follow up on this or would you like me to show another video? Yeah, I don't know if uh, they have heard or we can share another one. Okay, sure. If not it, then what is again? If not Pamakacha, then what else? And then, ear down, the clothes about all of it. Listen. Then, Ariki, I'm giving the floor back to you. Well, uh, in regards to your question about how and why do I use video and uh, song as art? Well, it's uh, obviously and clear that uh, not everybody that knows how to read and write, especially our women, refugee settlement. And, uh, Whenever we teach, we teach race, but the song is heard by many people. So in, in terms of art, we do draw. We also have talented youth and some men who does drawing. So drawing just simplify the session to enable the person to see what is happening, him or her, what he's going to do. So with that drawing, it enabled them to learn quicker than reading. That's number one. Number two, with the video, 
it enables people to see how things are being done in a local way, being imported from other people. Because before I started um, creating these materials locally, I used to share with my students videos that were produced by Morak, others by um, David Holmgren and other people from Pharmaculture Association across the world. But they could say, why? Why is it that it is made by only white? Can't it be made by us? They say, no, if it is like that, means that there is some story or science behind this. Then I talked to Murag, I said, now, you know, we should start producing our own local learning materials. She said, oh, wow, that's, that's fantastic. Then he, that's how we started making these local materials. So when people saw it in Uganda, they said, no, we need to stay and to go and meet this man. We need to come and see how you are training. We need also to be trained by you. Seeing how my garden is shining, they say, no, now we can do this. So when, whenever they have the video offline, they keep reviewing and viewing as they learn more. Then a song, some of them have this, these songs on their radio and the phone. So they, they play them, they share with the, their colleagues. So that's how it is helping me to advance and spread the skills and the knowledge with different people. So I'm also coming up with another option, see how best we can also share it through the local radios that we have near our settlement and the host community so that they can also be learning from that way. That's my view again. This is a new plan that I am planning to use again within this year. Thank you. Thank you. That sounds like a great, great plan. And it's a nice segue because you're actually talking about, you know, the use of the, of the the music and the radio and what was interesting in the video of course is the use of local languages to also communicate about the work that you're doing um i know that you speak more than 10 languages and that also gives you this possibility to teach uh permaculture in so many different refugees in in the region and uh and so it's i was curious about how this use of local languages could actually yeah help you to spread this teaching in a much wider way than if it was actually in English. And also acknowledging that at least only, at, I mean, acknowledging that 75% of the world population actually does not speak English and that so much of the teaching that's available today in the world is in English. Um, it's a great way for people to communicate, but it also has lots of limitations when it comes to reaching you know, populations uh, that, are, that are not speaking English. And um, so how, how this knowledge of local languages has been instrumental for you in reaching more and more people and how actually um, this permaculture training that you've been providing can actually be strengthened by integrating local indigenous knowledge or how does it resonate or like actually build on similar principles and the ones that are found in, in indigenous people's knowledge from the region or in traditional ecological knowledge that people may have passed down from generation? I know that there is also this big uh, debate and maybe controversy to some extent as to the fact that permaculture is very much rooted in traditional or indigenous ways of farming the land and that we need to acknowledge it for more, which I fully agree with. But I'm curious about your own experience, both with local languages and uh, traditional or indigenous people's knowledge on farming and agriculture. Well, uh, being the uh, English being the fact that is acquired the language, which is the mostly spoken by maybe Ugandans, whom as assumed to be their second language and their official language. For us, we were colonized by Belgium, which we speak only French. And those even who never went to French and Swahili. So using the local language is vital for the community, especially 
where we are. Because uh, my, to my side, I speak almost more than 15 languages in the host communities. If I go to Kenya, I'm a Kenyan. So their language, I have to speak them. If the same to Tanzania, Burundian, Rwandese, Congolese. So that's why in the song, you hear more than four languages spoken in the song and the video to enable diverse people to understand and get where the content and the message that's being delivered. That's how it has helped me to let many people understand well the message and what we are speaking about. To, um, to my experience, when we talk about indigenous people, yes, we have uh, we had our own culture in which have been changed by this so-called modern colonization or modern development or modern whatever. It is defined in two different ways, based on how people understand it. May I understand it differently because it has shifted us from our perspective to another way. Uh, initially, a man and a woman, when they quarrel, they couldn't go to police. They could find elderly people to advise them. Then from there, they called the two family. If it persisted, they called the two family. They sit together. So uh, combining permaculture ethics with our own cultural norms, it has helped me as a person who have been working as a peace builder and a peace representative in CAM. I've gone for several missions in several countries. But using this ethics of permaculture and the principle have helped me and my community to understand better what they were struggling for. Akumbe, they have been struggling around the answer of their problems. So we have integrated the principle into normal life in terms of peace building, economic development, and also income generating as well as financial. Uh, integrating this has gone deeper into the community because we are struggling just about the things that we know. Many people fled due to different conditions in, this, in the country. But when we, we came here, they could not understand to one another. But for the people who have taught permaculture and they have also gone to the village also taught others because the approach of using this, we are just mixing different people with different culture, different beliefs, different nationality. Then we give them tools. There are some who have not been speaking to others, but being the fact of what they have learned, the principle and ethics, people care, fair share, and ethic care, that's now how they're incorporating their daily life into that. Then going back to the principle, the same they are mimicking them. Because it was difficult for a person to visit another, assuming that, no, you, you are a Tutsi, we afraid because of you, you killed our neighbor. But we have come to learn that we are all struggling to meet one need. So if we are all refugees, why should we fight? And if now we, have, we are in the same group, we have a vegetables and you have a paste in your crops and I'm the one with the spray pump. If you don't come to pick it, then we, how will you eat? So they have learned to understand one another. In addition to that, we have the uh, seed saving. Would they have learned how to keep their seeds? And if one doesn't have another and have seeds, they are sharing seeds. So relationships have grown through permaculture. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Ben Ricky. Um, yeah, that's that's very, very interesting and moving way to think about how the link between the work you're doing and peace building and how important it is. Uh, for peace in, in the region. Um, my last question for you is uh, based on all your experience and all the work that you've been doing, how would, like, how would you like the project to be enhanced or improved or further supported in the future? Uh, what would be needed in order to 
um, to support the communities you're working with, with permaculture and to make them more resilient uh, in a context of well, there are various crises that are coming together, including the, the climate and the environmental crisis. So what would you need and what would you like to see grow in the future through your project? Well, um, the first thing and which is a major challenge to always and we do face is a, like now I'm, I'm traveling to teach. We need resources to enable us to reach more people. Um, we do conduct a training of three weeks. Whereas permaculture is, con is just being considered as 72 hours, which is maximum 10 days fully. But we make our own locally, we make 14 days fully. So uh, when we train participants, we need to cater for them in terms of, because you cannot train somebody starting from morning to evening from eight to five without eating. A named sack can't stand, does the same. Number two, uh, we do give them um, student toolkits. Uh, what are those kits? It's a, a whole a watering can, seeds and a wheelbarrow and a spray pump, which we give into group, we train 30 people. So those tools, help them to demonstrate and do practice and then obtain a yield from the tools and the knowledge that we have shared with them. And uh, that's the most crucial things. The third thing is to how best can we advance further to reach more people into different ways, like a digital learning, how can we best get uh, tools, resources like devices and access to the internet to enable more people attend this course? The fourth is how best can we have more seeds produced indignously without just buying these GMO seeds? Um, this comes to the farm that we are looking at and the farm that we are developing to see how best we can use the farm to produce more seeds to be shared across uh, East Africa and uh, the entire Africa. If we don't even focus or talk about East Africa, not East Africa, no one that have this issue of hunger or famine and also refugees, the entire Africa as well as the entire world. So how can we extend from Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Burundi, to also Mozambique, Malawi, and other countries in Africa? But also without forgetting our mother country, Congo, which is the richest country and is regarded as the least poorest country. And when we talk about marine nutrition, it is the first so we would do as well wish to have more ambassadors, have more cities produced from here in Uganda, supplied to Congo and the Central Africa, the Central African Republic and the Mozambique. People are starving there as well as Malawi. So that is my dream. I pray that God help us to reach at least half of it, no matter how we cannot fulfill it. Hope that is enough. I've talked about four things. Yeah, I mean, you feel free to add any other if you want to, but that's already yeah, quite a, a great ambitious program. And I really, really hope you get all the support that you need and, and, and that you can get for all this work and that we can contribute to it the best we can.